probably already starting to get dark on me. I gotta get to the bottom before it does. Just keep going down, Les. Keep going down. Oh God, oh God. It's starting to feel like a bad idea. It's already been five days of survival in the mountains of Norway. And most of that time was spent trapped by wet, cold, and windy weather in a small car in the snow. My food rations only lasted three days. For the last two, I've had nothing to eat. I've been able to rip the car apart, salvage from it useful material for boots and shelter. And now, fed up with feeling trapped and looking to better my circumstances, I'm taking to the roads to walk my way out. Roads don't always mean salvation. They can often lead nowhere. I'm following human tracks, but they just keep on going. Nothing in sight yet. So I'm gonna take a break. Night's coming soon, and uh, my toes are frozen. I'm gonna switch to uh, my homemade mucklucks, the snow off the side of the trail super deep. I'm gonna settle in here, I gotta take a break. I'm glad it's colder now than it has been for the last five days spent stuck in a small car. At least with the colder temperatures higher up the mountainside, the snow isn't wet, the air is drier, so the chill doesn't seep through my clothing and into my bones. Having pieces of the car to use for my shelter is a huge advantage over starting with nothing. I've had better shelters, but this one's pretty solid. I'm up off the snow, that's the main thing. All right, this is it. This is my spot for the night. Full moon's finished now, so it gets very dark early. I'm wearing pretty much everything that I have, every scrap I could find, I'm wearing or wrapped around me. Got the sleeping bag wrapped up around me and underneath me. I'm on a solid wood platform between me and the snow. It makes such a huge difference. I can't think anymore. I need some food. I have a feeling this is going to be a long night. And I have a second feeling that I'm not going to be sleeping much. And right now, that car is looking pretty good. Sometimes lost in the ordeal, the obvious can escape me. Without food and sleep, my brain doesn't fire on all cylinders. I just thought of something. <laughs> I didn't even remember this. Remember the survival kit in the car? Remember it was that little travel stove? I've got it. I've got it. Let's find out if this works. If it does, I'm gonna heat up some water. I've put the uh, reflector sheet up all around here, hoping that uh, it'll reflect. Though being stuck in a car for almost a week was a challenge, there's a relief in the advantage of having an emergency kit. Sometimes even one item can make the difference between surviving or perishing. Even this little flame, as chemical as it is, feels great. I'm gonna throw a couple of spruce twigs into the water. There's vitamin C in evergreen needles, so it can't hurt. Just while I'm sitting here, you can see the moon through the trees. Even in a night of survival, you can still see the beauty of the natural world. Even if sometimes it doesn't feel beautiful, it always is. Stuck in the middle of the bush, wearing everything I have, sitting on pieces of ripped out car, and boiling water. Now that's survival. I like this little survival stove. It's getting a thumbs up in my book, I think. Oh. Oh, that's good. In reality, 
Hypothermia is sometimes only a degree or two away. Wow. I can taste the spruce needles in the, uh, in the water. A little turpentiny, but it takes the uh, blandness out of it just being hot water. Oh, it's so important to rehydrate. It's also important to vacate your bladder in a survival situation, especially the cold like this. Your body spends a lot of time trying to heat up that liquid inside your body, inside your bladder. So get rid of it before you are going to try and curl in for the night. That's what I do. And uh, I find it makes a big difference. And if I've got any food at all, it's good for me to have a little bite right before I try to sleep so that the heat inside my stomach, the digestive heat, warms up my body through the night. But I don't have any food. But I do have hot water. On the sixth day of survival in the cold, I've decided to leave behind my portable shelter. It was heavy and got me too sweaty while I trekked the cold mountainside. Free of the heavy load, I'll take my chances hiking the road now. You know, there are a lot of different additive forces in survival. Certainly, the will to live is the most important. But that's followed by luck, kind of shape you're in, oh, all sorts of things. Geographically, where you are, whether you're alone or with other people. And a big one for me is whether or not you have a survival kit. It might seem like a small thing at the time, but there are items within a survival kit that can actually save your life and make a big difference. And I'm not talking about grab off the shelf survival kits that are available today. I'm talking about putting stuff together yourself so you know what you've got, you know how to use it, and you know that it works. That's the only kind of survival kit to have in my books. If I didn't have this road to walk on, I wouldn't be getting anywhere fast. Human tracks in the snow are a huge boost to morale, providing you can actually run into the people themselves and find that their trail leads out and not another 100 miles through the wilderness. Coming up around this bend, I thought I saw something in the snow here, and I did. There's fresh human tracks leading up the hill here, and at the top, I can just make out the faint outline of a rooftop. So I got my hopes held high right now that this is going to be a little bit of salvation. The trail looks like it goes straight up. I don't care. That's where I'm headed. When you think about what I've had to eat for, uh, I don't know, what is it, six days? I need some food. Had to be straight up, didn't it? Had to be. Well, the same rules still apply to me now as any other time, even though I'm excited to see this trail. And I'm hoping that there's something good on the other end. Because it's not about being a stunt man. It's certainly not about running around and jumping up and down and diving into frothing gorges or anything like that. Reality of survival. Slow, easy, methodical, calculated risks. Then you come out alive. And that's what survival's all about. The classic woodsman or hunter is a natural survival expert. Oh, that's good. Oh. But that's because they may spend their whole lives training in the forest, learning all the nuances of what it really takes to survive with each moment in the bush. <laughs> I can see a cabin. In fact, I see a couple of cabins. What I really like now is to see some smoke coming out of a chimney. Suddenly, I feel a renewed sense of vigor and energy. Hello? Six days of survival on a mountainside in Norway, and I've come across a great find, abandoned cabins. Hello? Nothing. Not even a dog barking. Hello? Quite the view. It's all blocked out by snow right now, but that's the fjord down there. I hope there's a wood stove. And these aren't just storage sheds. These buildings look old, very old. Probably the 30s or 40s. But I know I'm going to be one of these buildings tonight, wood stove or not. Huh. Well, that's the first building. <clears throat> Huh. 
Well, that's a good little building. Come in here if I have to, but I want to see where the tracks lead. A compound out in the woods here. I can't tell if the tracks are snowed over from this current snow or if they're just older. Hello? I see firewood. That's a good sign. What's this? That's what I thought it was. See hunters. Deer head. Hello? This is pretty sweet. I think I hit the jackpot. Check this out. Oh, look at this. 1946. I was right. But this is, this is a reality sometimes. I always say, in a survival situation, you come across a cottage or a cabin, it's actually legal in most places to break in and not be charged with it if you're in a survival situation. Obviously, they're Norwegians. And this place looks beautiful to me right now. The snow's just coming down strong. I'm gonna start a fire and get warmed up. There's matches and candles, sleeping bag, beds, wood stove. Oh, there's even a radio. Cook stove, no food. But a deer head. After six days surviving in the Norwegian mountains, I've lucked into a huge advantage, a hunter's cabin. And what's better, some left behind deer remains. So with a simple twist of fate, a fantastic boost changes a deadly circumstance. And whether I find garbage or a dead fish left behind by an eagle or a deer carcass left behind by hunters, either way, it all represents digestible nutrition, especially after three days on little rations followed by two days with no food at all. Oh, this is gonna feel so good. But it'll be getting dark very, very soon. I couldn't be in a better place at this point. This cabin and this food are prime examples of why proactive, mobile survival can often be far better than just staying put, but it takes skill to move on. All right, that's perfect. That's just a bit of uh, deer fat and a little tiny bit of deer meat. Um, I'm gonna cook that up, get that right into me, and uh, assuming I'm likely still hungry, go back for the liver and the heart. I see there in the bag as well. Lungs, liver, heart, a bunch of fats in the bag. I figure that's fair game. I don't think they're too worried about that. I'm sure it was probably meant to be dog food, so it'll go well in my stomach right now. Okay, hopefully I can get that onto some kind of a boil with the fire like this, and uh, wow, 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 <laughs> that's unbelievable. This is uh, a lot better. The timing of this find couldn't be better, because outside the snow is coming down heavy and this high up the mountainside. The best thing I can be doing right now is drinking the broth. Bombarding my stomach with too much food, especially meat, after six days with little to no food, could make me quite sick. Starting with a simple broth is the best way to reawaken my digestive system to taking in food. Wow. Oh, boy, that's good. Mmm. <sighs> oh, my gosh. Oh, it was definitely worth coming up this trail. If you ever want to experience really great tasting food, spend a week without it. Okay, time for an update. It's uh, been, I think, six days now that I've been out here. The first four and a half days were stranded with a vehicle in the snow, and uh, then a pretty bad night in the woods. It's been scant rations since I started, so this deer is fantastic for me right now. And that makes me feel like playing a happy song.
Seven days in the mountains, and snow, and the last 12 hours have been the best. I found a hunter's cabin along with deer remains, and they've given me an incredible boost both psychologically and physically. But outside, it's still winter. That was a far better night of survival than uh, sleeping in the back of a stuck vehicle or spending a night in the bush. I can tell you that much. I'm gonna go out and look around the cabin and see what else is here. Obviously, I'm set for shelter and no problem for heat and warmth. I think I'll cook up a liver if I don't see any hunters return. There's a tremendous amount of nutrition in an animal carcass, and it's not gonna be lost on me. Not this day. There's some meat and fat up inside the head here. That's all there is. They've taken all the good meat back with them. But this is a lot of food for me. No question about it. Won't be the first time I got blood on my cameras. The whole liver's here for me to enjoy. And the heart is here. And then just a whole lot of fat that I can make some more broth with. I know it doesn't look all that good, but <laughs> to me, it looks like a feast right now. Even the little cabin is dark and closed in, so I'd rather build a fire outside and cook up a solid meal. There's matches inside, so that's not a problem. But still, just to uh, conserve some of this old duct tape, I'm gonna use that to light the fire. Four days of claustrophobia in the small car have got me happy to stay outside for my first real meal. One thing about duct tape, Good fire starter. I know it seems like I maybe should just eat a ton of this deer, eat the heart, eat the liver, eat the fat, just sort of go for it and, and kind of gorge. It's been seven days and my stomach is probably the size of a walnut by now. So I don't have a lot of room. And if I eat too much, I'll end up with diarrhea. I don't wanna have diarrhea out here. I don't have any problems out here. In survival, you've got to lessen all of your problems. Get rid of them one by one by one. I had a lot of broth last night. Now I'm going to finally eat some meat. I'm going to give it a shot here. Even just to have a piece. Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> this is great. Oh. I don't care if you don't like liver or not. This is delicious. It's one of those moments where I can feel the energy starting to course through my veins almost instantly. I think that's why I'm all of a sudden talking faster. Oh, wow, this is good. At this very moment, this is the best lever I've had in my life. Mmm, Norwegian deer liver. Most of the time, any dead animal in the bush is gonna be snatched up almost immediately by crows and ravens and birds and foxes. That food's gone within a day, within hours sometimes. So it's really lucky to come across a dead animal. That said, a lot of times I have in my wanderings come across hunter's remains before. Come across a bear carcass before and uh, two moose carcass and a deer carcass. So, and I'm not complaining today. In a survival situation, when I come upon a great advantage, it gives me a chance to take stock and build up my energy for continued proactive survival. Staying put here could end up being just as big a mistake as staying anywhere else. I'm not so sure. I think I'd prefer to have a flashlight with batteries. I know this thing lasts forever, but you have to keep winding it up every time you want to use it. This is going to be my last night in the uh, cabin. I'm going to head down to the fjord. I can't stay here forever, because otherwise I'm going to sit here. I'm just going to run out of deer, and then I'm still stuck up here. Well, the radio doesn't work, but the bed sure does. I got this one coming to me. Tonight is a night for intense and crazy dreams. They'll hit me strong when I have no food in my stomach. And they get even more intense and profound once I fill my belly for the first time, as I have with all the deer meat and fat. Left to survive long enough, and the dreams become hallucinations. All too often, I've had vivid dreams of my family and warmth, only to wake up and find myself still sleeping in the mud or on the cold and frozen ground.
It's my eighth day of survival now, and as easy as it may seem to consider heading down the hill, I could end up at the top of an impassable cliff and find myself stuck in the wet snow on the side of the mountain for the night. I'll have to pass through a wide range of temperatures and I'll likely end up in the freezing rain. Knowing this makes it hard to leave such comfort. That's the way I found it. My hike down should really only be one long hike, possible to do in one day. There are even established trails in this area if I can find them and not lose them. But sometimes a single mile in the thick bush can seem like it will never end. Such a paradox, you know, the winter bush is always so, so beautiful, especially here in Norway. Absolutely stunning scenery. Yet, if you're lost out here without food, shelter, fire, protection from the elements, they can be deadly. What I'm into, I think, what am I at, eight days now? The liver and the fat from the deer made a huge difference. I cut up a bunch of the meat. I'm carrying it with me. This is not like fasting. You know, people at home fast for even 10 days, drinking lemon juice and cayenne pepper and maple syrup. That's great. But when you're out in the bush like this, you don't want to be fasting. That's where I have to head down. It's still snowing, it's been snowing off and on. I'm wondering if when I get down the fjord, if it's gonna be snowing or raining. What I'm doing is following a creek that leads down to the fjord, there's no question. So it's just a long way down. The camera doesn't do justice to just how steep and slippery this trek down really is. I just don't want to end up at a cliff somewhere. Coming back up would be tough. I'm trying to see my way down, but snow's getting in my eyes. Going down's a lot easier on the cardio but a lot harder on the legs, that's for sure. I wasn't expecting this. Everything is conspiring to put me in a dangerous position. I knew this area had a trail I could use to get down the hill, but I keep losing it. And now I'm getting wet in all ways. My sweat, the rain, the snow. Falling and slipping down the hill is ripping my clothing apart. It just keeps getting steeper. And these are slippery boots. I'm past the point of no return now, and I can't go back up and make it to the cabin before dark. Exhaustion is overtaking my legs, and I'm soaked to the skin. It's starting to feel like a bad idea. It's only been a few hours, but the landscape I've put myself in is steeper than what I'd hoped. And most of the time, I'm climbing down a slippery and rocky hill with all of the weight of the cameras on my back. I'm making my own recipe for disaster. Sorry about the camera lens there. I can't believe I'm actually crawling downhill. But this snow is making all these rocks really slick. And it's a long way down. Going downhill that's this steep takes a lot out of you. And I'm sweating. Bad news. Damn. It's probably already starting to get dark on me. I gotta get to the bottom before it does. As long as I don't come up against the cliff, I'll be okay. Kinda like what's happening to me right now. I can't go back. Ah, oh,
Heading down the mountain has turned out way worse than I expected. I'd known from my understanding of this area that getting down to the ocean is possible, but many of the areas are far too steep to manage, and getting trapped at the top of a cliff is a real danger. Going back up this exhausted and in the slippery wet snow is not an option now. Getting trapped in between a cliff and nowhere to go is a real possibility. This is an easy way to break an ankle. Just keep going down, Les. Keep going down. It'll be all right. Ugh. Oh, God. Oh, God. Now that I'm soaked through to the skin, completely without radio contact to the outside world, survival couldn't get any more real. This is not a sound effect. My body cam is picking up the sound of my heart racing. More than being chased by a jaguar, more than having heat stroke, this simple trek down a mountainside has turned into one of the most dangerous situations I've ever been in. <coughs> I catch my breath. I'm soaked through to my skin in the wet snow and rain. The sun is dropping fast and that puts me at great risk from succumbing to hypothermia if I have to spend the night here. I can't go back up. The uphill climb on the slippery rocks is now too much for my exhausted legs. I'm still carrying 65 pounds of camera gear, and I may be trapped going down. Every time I look ahead, I see cliffs. I just want to get to the shore before dark. That's all I'm asking. Six hours of being lost and constant downhill climbing on slippery rocks has left me exhausted and without strength. And the sun is dropping fast. I'm soaked. I think I made it to the shore, though. I can see ripples on the water. Hope that's not just an illusion for me. I got what I wish for. I'm at the bottom. There's the ocean. It's raining. And no shelter. I'm soaked. I was better off in the cabin. My legs are shaking and weak, but I am at least at the ocean's edge. The sun is dropping fast. There's often no worse survival situation than to be soaking wet with night falling and no shelter. To experience my core body temperature dropping enough to make me hypothermic is a very real possibility in a situation like this. This is gonna suck. It's still better than being stuck halfway up the mountain, drenched to the bone in the freezing rain. I'll tell you, there were some moments there I was pretty stressed out. And all I saw in front of me were cliffs. This is not a time for rock climbing. Not in a survival situation. If you've ever done any uh, whitewater canoeing or diving or anything like that, when you have to put your wetsuit on when it's cold and wet, that's what this feels like right now. You'll know what I'm talking about. My cameras are all dying from the rain. I just got these last two cameras going for me here. Remember this little guy? Well, it worked up on the mountain. It 
see how it works down here. Okay, we have fire. I got some of that deer fat in there. Oh. All that is is deer fat. And right now, it tastes like the best filet mignon I could ever imagine. And it's really important that I eat this fat now because the fat will keep you whoa. Okay then. The fat will keep me warm inside through the night. Maybe it won't be so bad of a night after all. <laughs> all right. We got about 10 hours of darkness to go through right now. I always know it's a rough night of survival when getting warm means getting up and exercising just to get my blood moving and give myself a flush of heat for my muscles. This action allows me to sleep for just another 20 minutes. This is one of those situations where a, a nice big tarp would be helpful. It's just off and on raining. Right now it feels like it's about 4 in the morning. I'll bet you it's only about 11.30 p.m. The reality of survival is that it always comes down to 3 o'clock in the morning. If you can get past that, then you can make it. But that's the hardest time, 3 in the morning, when you wish you were sleeping and you wish you were somewhere else. It's been a long night. Sleep was reduced to 10 minutes maybe 20 minutes at a time, waking up with the, the, the chills. It's a brutal night like that when you're soaking wet and you're stuck out in a shelter. You've heard of the proverbial being stuck between a rock and a hard place? Well, this is what it looks like. One last thing I can do before I go is I've got this leftover fat and it's congealed now and I can actually wipe it on my boots. This won't, that won't even help a little, that actually help a lot. I'm just gonna rub this stuff. There's enough to rub over all, all of the boots and get them uh, protected a bit more from the rain, protected a bit more from the wet. A single coating of animal fat grease can go a long way towards keeping my feet dry. I'm finding trails, and then the trails stop. I'm gonna find another trail. I'm not far, I'm about 100 yards up from the ocean's edge. I see a couple of little caves up in there I could have crawled into last night. I'll remember them for tonight. This is a lot easier going. Oh, oh, oh. There's a rose hip too. Oh, there's a couple more. I didn't even see these. Look at this. Mmm. Oh yeah. That's a major score. The rose hips have pound for pound more vitamin C than, than oranges. And these ones are delicious. Mmm. And they get to being soft. Wow, that's good. Ow, ow, ow! I'll eat the soft ones and make tea out of the hard ones. Oh, that's good. It's a lot of fresh water around here. It's a good thing, too. Otherwise, I'd be reduced to uh, probably having to drink my own pee. <laughs> yeah, right. You gotta see this to believe it. Check it out. Hello? 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 It's a big old house, barn. I don't see any signs, I don't see any footprints. Odds are it's locked up. Most people leave a key hidden somewhere. Start here. This is the usual obvious place. Cut firewood. You know what that means? 
It means there's got to be a wood stove in here somewhere. Let's check out upstairs. Everything's empty. Huh, little mini wood stoves. Cots. Empty rooms though. All cleaned and cleared out, but nothing in it. Well, that's an old stove. Every room here has its own little wood stove and Norwegian flag. Good spirits here. Good spirits. I'm going to go downstairs. I'm going to light up that wood stove, strip down, and get my clothes all dry again. So I'm still drenched to the skin. I can't believe I'm inside a cottage. Now this is what I'm talking about when it comes to survival. This is a huge boon. I can't tell you, there are lots of stories of people who have uh, survived simply because they came upon a cabin or a cottage or just a remote home or farmstead. And uh, that's my situation here. I'm gonna take advantage of it. It's been nine days uh, with really little more than a few food, food rations that, that died off quickly and uh, some deer fat and that deer liver. And that's what I think I'm gonna do as well is I've still got some leftover deer liver so I'm gonna cook it up. What a score. This house is closed for the season, so there's no food left behind. It still only represents one part of the survival equation, shelter. I'll still need to find more food for long-term survival. All right, look at this, I want you to see something. Up and behind me, there's some cliffs. Had I gone the wrong way, those cliffs are what I would have been faced with. There would have been no way down without killing myself. I would have had to climb back up all the distance I'd slid down. It's the same thing off to the other side. I only had a, a narrow path. It's amazing that I made it as far as I did and the way I did, because it's easy to get yourself up and out onto a spot and then be stuck there. And the way I was doing yesterday, there's no way I would have been able to climb back up. I just wish I'd found this place last night. we go. Look at that. Now those are blue mussels. So now they can be seriously bad for my stomach if I eat them wrong, but I won't eat them wrong. Let's see if I can get some more. There's got to be hundreds of mussels here. If I found this many in this tiny little spot, there should be hundreds of mussels here and I can eat this seaweed too. Well, it's not seaweed. And honestly, I don't know what the proper name for it is. I just know I can eat it. That's just an old potato field, but there may be potatoes in it, and you got to explore every opportunity. They're really soft. Little potatoes. Not much, but survival food. I'll take what I can get. There we go. Hey, that's a good hard potato. Bonus. Okay, so the trick to these little guys is to get rid of the insides. That's a little bit uh, gnarly on the stomach, but even the, uh, the meat itself has got to be boiled. So, I don't know. Okay, didn't have to hit so hard. That works. So I just want to find the meat. Get rid of all the guts. That's not much. It's a fingerful. But uh, there's lots of them. This one's a little bigger. 
And these are called blue mussels. There we go. So I'm kind of making a mess of these guys, but that's the deal with mussels. Like pulling mussels from a shell. And once you pull out their stomachs and intestines, you're only left with a little morsel of meat. But still protein. Okay, so I can't believe I'm actually doing this in the kitchen. Mind you, it's a bit of a stolen kitchen, but it'll work. And I've got the um, seaweed as well, or whatever you call this. I'm going to put that in uh, and cook that up. So I should have a bit of a stew going on here. I've got deer fat left over. I've got the mussels, I've got the seaweed, and um, oh, and the rose hips even, in the water that was my deer fat. So it should be a real nice sort of smooth, oily, rose hip kind of flavored broth. Once you get to this stage, once you get to nine days, it's amazing I can string a sentence together. String a couple sentences together. See, I can't even do that. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's the biggest thing about food. It's the last on the list of survival priorities, but what happens is without it, you start losing your energy. Finding a cottage is the ultimate advantage in a survival situation. Just as ripping apart a car is justified, so is breaking into a deserted house for shelter. It's illegal at any other time, but not when it comes to survival. I knew there would be houses along the coast it was a large part of my motivation for wanting to get down here as soon as I could. I didn't want another night sleeping amongst the rocks. Okay, so I've made myself up this sort of soupy broth. Let me show you what I'm dealing with here. Seaweed, rose hips, mussels, fresh water, deer liver. A couple of potatoes from the garden. And yeah, I know it looks disgusting, but it's a lot of nutrition. It would seem that in this survival ordeal, I've experienced the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. Yesterday was probably one of the most nervous times I've ever had out in the, in the bush. I was truly worried for uh, my situation. If I'd come up to a cliff and not been able to get, get down it in any way, and it was all slippery, then I would have, I mean, I was just crawling at that point. I would have had to try to crawl back up and it would have been, I mean, it was half an hour before dark. So to be here now, I'm giddy to be honest with you, to be here now. What I'll do is I'll go down by the shore front and I'll put together a signal fire. And, uh, and I still have from the survival kit, from the car, the flares. So I'm gonna send them off too and see if they work. Or at least see how well they work. I'm finally gonna sleep well tonight. It's been a long 10 days of survival in Norway. Five days stuck in a car, four days trekking on the mountainside, and now here, enjoying the luxury of someone's summer cottage. Albeit without much food, but I'm ready to get out of here. Back to warmth and safety, and back to food. People who come and looking for me are gonna watch for me all along the shoreline. They don't know whether I'm gonna be in a shelter in the bush, at a cliff edge, or here I am at this uh, big homestead. What a bonus. So I'm gonna get a signal fire set up down by the shore. Uh, I think survival manuals tend to make signal fires a little too complicated. They don't need to be all that complicated. You just need a smoky fire that's ready to light in an instant. That's the end of it. So that's what I'm gonna build. You can never assume that you're easily spotted. In my case, I'm wearing gray clothes and standing on a gray rock studded shoreline. That is my smoke maker, I hope. Back at home, I'd use moss from the bush. I'm hoping this seaweed might work just as well. If you remember, way back when I was stranded with the car, I siphoned out some gas into this jar of peanut butter, so it's in my peanut butter gas. And uh, I should get the fire going. All the safety team has to spot is a fire or some of the smoke. There's a boat way over on the far shore, and it looks like they're going slow and stopping and scanning. So if that's my boat, I'm going to try the signal now. 
Can we go windproof match? Go for it. Come on. There we go. It's not these flames that are gonna work for me. It's all this punky stuff. Woo. On top, that it's gonna make the smoke. From the car survival kit. Flares. Oh, you're kidding me. Oh, that's gnarly. I pulled the wire right out of the flare. And nothing. That's not a lifesaver. Got one other, I'll try it. Second flare, but also past its expiry date. Wow, you gotta check these things. I'm looking at this, it says 1993. That's just dumb. Ha, ah, nothing. Okay, these are great flares. I've used them before. I just haven't used them when they were expired, and it shows you. When it comes to survival kit items, they gotta be up to date. All right, I'm gonna pour a little bit more gas on that fire. See if that helps. I know they're looking for fire, so. It's the flames that finally do the trick and make me noticeable by the boat on the far shore. That's working. I think the nose of their boat is headed this way. After 10 days, I'm going home. I've spent 10 years making survival films all around the world. And now, I've spent 10 days surviving in the Norwegian mountains. While here, I've experienced the worst day of survival I've ever had. I hit the complete peak of my own personal will to live and drive to survive. And then it was followed by the best day of survival I've ever had. Finding not just a small cabin or a building, but an actual abandoned house with a bed to sleep on. Survival is not without irony.